Um, it is 12.30. I'm going to give everyone a few more minutes to, uh, or a few minutes, maybe a minute to get logged in. There's still people coming in at a pretty brisk clip. So I appreciate everyone's time. All right, it's 12.31. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining today. We're going to have a webinar on the update to the City of San Luis Obispo's Economic Development Strategic Plan, also called an ES EDSP. Um, we're going to record the webinar today. It'll be available on our website after uh, later on this afternoon. And we are asking everyone to put your questions into the Q&A, and we'll address those questions trying to keep that record and also maintain everyone's privacy since it will be posted on the web. Um, my name is Lee Johnson. I'm the Economic Development Manager for the City of San Luis Obispo. I'm joined by our partners at TIP Strategies, who are the consultants on the project, and Molly Kano, who's our Tourism Manager. Uh, Mishka, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and put up the presentation. I will do a little bit of background, and then Jeff Marcel will do um, cover TIP and what they do, and then Mishka Parkins will walk us through the presentation, and we will address questions as we go, questions at the end, and if we see them in the chat, we can answer them during the presentation. We'll do that. But again, if you can type your questions in the chat, that is much appreciated. All right, next slide. So economic development in the city of SLO, we started back in 1995 when we created the economic development and natural resources positions. Um, back then, it was really about sales tax generation. It was big box stores, car dealerships, trying to get revenue into the city. Um, after the 2008-2009 issues we had uh, with uh, you know, global internet issues, all that kind of thing, shut down, um, we really started then to say we need to focus a little differently on how we do economic development. So we did our first economic development strategic plan that was approved in 2012. That was really focused on head of household job creation. In 2015, uh, we were going through our general plan update, land use and circulation element, which created a lot of new opportunity for housing development, things like that. So we focused in the update on development and how to make our development review processes better, things like that. Um, then we were planning to update in 2020 uh, with COVID, et cetera. We decided to push that update off until 2022, we started uh, in December, and now we are getting ready to take it to council. This draft, uh, this update focuses on the changes in economic development, both kind of globally and system-wise, and also here in San Luis Obispo, all right? Uh, the current economic development strategic plan is really based on meaningful public engagement, lots of data and a lot of analysis, focused on creating a system that supports and sustains industries that create head of household jobs, development, innovation, um, and a head of household jo job at the time was defined as income level greater than 50,000, career ladder, education and technical still, employer benefits and stability. If a job met any of those four criteria, it was considered a head of household job. Uh, the current ESP, EDSP has four overarching strategies, breaking down barriers to job creation, actively supporting knowledge innovation, and promote and enhance the San Luis Obispo quality of life, and then building on existing efforts and strengthening regional partnerships. Okay. What has changed since 2015? A, a lot of things. Work is evolving due to the pandemic and other reasons. Economic development is evolving systemically as well as locally. Our community is, evol is evolving, and the C organization is growing and evolving as well. Things like DEI, sustainability, we're not really a focus of economic development in 2015, but that's changed nationally as well as here locally in San Luis Obispo. The QR code on the screen takes you to a um, website that has all of the information on the DSP. You can find the current draft. You can find the links to um, Open City Hall where you can put comments on the draft. All the information is there. 
I'll turn it over to Jeff and he can talk a little bit about TIP strategies. Thank you very much, Lee. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeff Marcel. I'm a senior partner with TIP Strategies. And today I'm joined by Mishka Parkins, who is a consultant with our team, along with Alex Cook, who's a senior vice president of consulting for TIP. Um, let me give you a quick introduction to who we are as a firm. Uh, TIP is a nationally recognized economic development and workforce development strategic planning firm. Um, our company is 28 years old, and during that 28-year history, we've worked in over 350 communities around the country in helping them analyze their local economies and develop economic development strategic plans. Let's give you a quick project overview so you have an appreciation for the work that we've had underway. Um, this has been the project goal, and it's about uh, it, continuing to advance the economic vitality of the city of Slow and develop strategies that strengthen the city's economic development efforts while integrating the principles of sustainability, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, this is the project timeline. This has been an eight month project. We started back in December. Um, and during this whole time frame, we've been gathering a tremendous amount of stakeholder input. We've been compiling research and we've been guided by our steering committee. Um, we are on track to complete the project in the latter portion of July. And you heard me reference the strategic input or the community input that we've received, and, and it's been extensive. We've done a whole series of one on one interviews as well as a series of roundtables and community input sessions on a whole host of other different topics that address the local economy. Those have been attended by over 140 uh, individuals uh, representing the community. Um, in addition to that, we did an economic visioning survey and received over 980 responses to that survey. And then we've done multiple tours of the city. We've been in every single neighborhood across the city of Slope. We've also compiled this, an extensive economic analysis of the city. We've built a 30 different data sets that are in four different categories, including data regarding uh, population and demographics and employment and industry information, as well as talent and workforce information as, and environmental information. All of this data is available online on the city's website. And, you heard me reference earlier that we compiled a, a, a vision survey and had over 980 responses. That, had, that survey had 16 different questions. It was open for four different weeks. Um, this, is this, this is an example of a question that was asked uh, along with results presented in a word cloud format. And once again, this is also available. The entire responses to all of the surveys and the questions are available online at the city's website as well. So all of this information, all of the input, all of the research that we've captured has led us to a set of key findings. And, and we've tried to synthesize these key findings and summarize them here for you. Um, quality of place is certainly a priority for everyone in San Luis Obispo. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as sustainability are very important to the city's approach to economic vitality. Um, Cal Poly has a significant influence on the community. Um, Slow's visitor economy is a critical economic driver. Uh, systemic changes impede talent retention and attraction, things like cost of living. Um, and the city should take a strategic approach to commercial uh, development, given the limited amount of space that's remaining within the city. And all of these findings have helped guide our uh, draft strategies and actions. And I'm going to actually turn it over to Mishka now to take you through our draft the strategic plan. All right. Thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be taking you through the plan framework, if I could just get my slides to work here. All right, there we go. So I'll be taking you through the plan framework first before we give you a quick pre preview of the strategies within the update draft. Um, and essentially, the plan framework is what creates that base structure for the strategic plan. There are three primary components to the plan framework. Um, but before I jump into the, the framework itself, I just want to share that in developing this framework, it was truly both an internal and external effort. So 
Luckily, our team was able to work very closely with uh, city staff, as well as some external partners like Downtown Slow, Cal Poly, and the Chamber of Commerce. So we were able to share this framework with these groups and come to a final um, set or structure that we were all comfortable with. So the first um, and the foundational component of the framework is really the mission, mission statement. That is what kind of grounds the plan. And that, as you can see here, is all about promoting, encouraging, enhancing uh, the economic environment within the city to ensure that it is dynamic and resilient and also making sure that there is a focus on uh, sustainable and equity, equitable policies, programs, and processes. The second component is the uh, guiding principles. And we like to think of guiding principles as the lens through which all of the strategies that are included in the plan are measured against. So um, all of the plans that we currently have drafted um, tie back to either one or more of each of these guiding principles. So we have five principles that we came up with based on the city's current goals and their key priorities. And those are economic resilience, which is really about maintaining a dynamic economic uh, business environment. Um, the second is around equitable and inclusive economic development. So that's making sure that e economic opportunities are open and accessible to all residents and businesses within the city of SLO. The third is around sustainable economic development. So that has a bit of a dual meaning in that it's about ensuring that economic vitality can be sustained through both activities that are climate focused as well as system focused. The fourth guiding principle is around um, having a holistic approach. So making sure that the city is not just working across departments, but also extending outside um, outside the um, actual organization's limits and, and working with those external partners to make sure that they can implement and execute the strategies that are provided within the plan. And then the fifth one is um, around that regional collaboration. So carrying over one of those strategic approaches um, from the last plan, just ensuring that uh, the city continues to partner with organ organizations based on their goals and um, toward implementation of the plan. The third aspect is the major pillars. And I'll provide more detail on each of these along with some examples in the slides that will follow. But uh, you can think of the major pillars as like the three major categories that each of the strategies will fall under. So, before we actually get into that, though, I do want to make a note that in working with the city and thinking about some of these recommendations and what would actually work, um, we had to think about it with a couple of constraints, right? So we had to think about the recommendations from the frame of what the local government can actually control, as well as what the, the scope of work or the key function of the economic development team is. So that'll kind of give you a better idea in terms of how we came up with these strategies and why they're primarily focused on activities that the actual economic development and tourism program can impact. So um, with that said, uh, it's also worth noting that, you know, local government really has power in terms of shaping those trends more so at that local level, right? And when you start to look out further, you know, at the state level, national level, it's really just about putting systems in place to be able to respond to things that are going on externally. So in terms of the levers of control, that would look like things like um, the planning and zoning laws, 
um, making sure that the local business support is strong, um, initiating policies and programs and initiatives that can solve some of those things or mitigate some of those larger issues at the local level. Um, there is also the opportunity to influence. So this is more so kind of working with partners and working with other organizations that may specialize or target a specific area um, and making sure that there, there's an opportunity there to facilitate collaboration amongst partners that may have shared goals, um, making sure that they're also advocating for some of those economic development priorities and where possible funding those initiatives um, to solve issues that may arise. Uh, it's also worth noting that, of course, there are going to be some things that happen, you know, at the national level, especially that the city really just does not have control of. And you can see um, some of those here. So when we're talking about things like interest rates and inflation, um, there's really not much that the local government can do to mitigate or prevent some of those issues. So with that, I'm going to jump into our major pillars, um, starting with the first one here, uh, it's business and entrepreneur vitality. And that's really about working on improving the local business environment and making sure that entrepreneurs have the tools and the resources that they need to just thrive, to adapt, to be able to innovate and grow within the community, um, even in the face of challenges and potential disruptions. So there are a couple of areas here where we thought the city could really have a leading role, um, and that would be around business retention and expansion, as well as business preparedness, sustainability, and resiliency. So I won't go through um, each of these five top level strategies, but I'll share a couple of examples um, that I think would be relevant um, in terms of what the city can do uh, itself. So around business retention and expansion, it's really about um, creating that proactive and a very targeted approach to business support. So making sure that business needs are clear, um, making sure that the city is creating an environment that allows businesses to grow and thrive. And this will require, even though the city can lead some of these efforts, it really will require a lot of partnerships with um, organizations like the Chamber, uh, with Cal Poly, and just really working with partners to first like determine what those issues are, to start to document what those issues are, and addressing um, business needs, and in the long term, making sure that, that they're monitoring the level of impact they're able to have um, over time within that business community, within the business community. And the other one I'll share here is around business preparedness, sustainability, and uh, resiliency. And this is related primarily to disaster preparedness. So I'm sure you all know and have experienced the effects of um, recent flooding earlier in the year and how that could be um, not just disruptive to like your personal lives, but to businesses and how they operate. And it's important for the city to be able to respond to events like this. So we are recommended that recommending that the city approach preparedness, sustainability, and resiliency in a couple of ways. So one would be around starting to create some systems of response. So making sure that the business community is well aware of how the city will uh, respond to disasters and have a method or a means of communication um, with the business community in the event that a disaster does occur. The second component of this piece around preparedness and sustainability is really around education and making sure that the individual businesses are able to prepare um, on their own by creating uh, plans in terms of how they'll respond to certain disasters um, in order to provide just additional safeguards to improve their responsiveness to 
um, any kind of disasters that may occur. The second pillar is around placemaking and promotion. And as you um, can recall, Jeff mentioned that placemaking or quality of place was one of the things that were consistently um, referenced when we had our meetings. Um, slow is considered a great place to live, a great place to visit, a great place to work. So this, this pillar is really around making sure that the city can maintain its quality of place um, and continue to build on those local amenities. Um, but at the same time, while they're doing that, being able to also foster a sense of inclusion among um, not only residents, but businesses as well. So from here, um, we could take a look at the quality of place promotion. Um, that's really about just highlighting, continuing to highlight the city as an appealing destination, but instead of kind of focusing these efforts more so on external audiences like visitors, um, the idea here is really about looking at extending that messaging out to uh, residents as well, residents and businesses as well. So the city already has quite a bit of activities outlined within its tourism business improvement district strategic marketing plan um, that we think can be leveraged in order to reach a broader audience. Uh, we also think that there's some opportunities here for the city to kind of build outside of the downtown and get the neighborhoods involved and um, actually increasing some of that awareness of the amenities that are available to um, visitors and residents that fall outside of the downtown core. There are also some opportunities to um, really build on that inclusive neighborhood planning efforts. Um, this would largely be in collaboration with the community development department. Um, so making sure that this, the um, economic development and tourism team are maintaining those joint efforts um, and also communicating the need to increase or improve things such as like the supply of workforce or multifamily housing, um, making sure that there is a more structured community-based approach towards the planning efforts going forward. And then just advocating for things like greater accessibility to commercial corridors, to like job centers, um, schools and that sort of thing. The third piece is around talent development and attraction. And this is one of the areas where it's, it's not necessarily a pillar that I'd consider an area where the city would lead. It would play more of a supporting role or a facilitating role because there are training providers, um, educational institutions that would really take the lead in terms of some of these activities. But we have outlined some areas where we think the city can start to support those initiatives that develop the skills that are needed to to uh, develop the, the supply of quality jobs, as well as attracting and retaining a more skilled uh, talent base. So the first one here I can uh, talk about is really about system development. And this is, again, around partnership. So working with those education um, providers or workforce development providers and educational institutions um, as well as the chamber, um, and then making sure that the efforts that the city does target are in line with what its goals are in terms of like target industries and like target occupations that are able to uh, offer higher paying jobs. Um, then finally, I'd say it's it's really about being able to partner with industry and workforce training providers to actually proactively identify and address what some of that skill, those skilled labor gaps may be. 3.3 um, here around talent attraction and retention. Um, again, I think this is also an opportunity for the city to be able to leverage some of those tourism marketing materials 
Um, but in this case, it would be used in terms of attracting talent. So it would be, you know, leveraging the live the slow life brand personality beyond just targeting visitors to, to targeting actual talent that may really value an active outdoor lifestyle. Uh, I think there are also some opportunities there in the retention space. So having students from Cuesta, students from Cal Poly, even K through 12 students just that are graduating, just making sure that you are able to retain the students that are currently within the city by facilitating those stronger connections, not just with the educational uh, community, but also with um, employers and the broader community. So that would look like internship opportunities, mentorship opportunities, civic engagement opportunities, um, and volunteering opportunities as well. Um, in terms of getting some of those residents who may have left back, uh, there's, there are also, there's also a recommendation regarding um, launching a talent re-extraction campaign that would uh, focus in on folks who live in slow or went to school in slow at one point and moved for whatever reason uh, to come back and return. So that's a quick overview of some of the strategies. And I'm going to quickly turn it back over to Jeff to kind of queue up what we have coming next. Sure, thank you, Mishka, I appreciate that. And um, let's talk to you a little bit about what's next. Um, we know, of course, Lee shared with you where you can see everything about what's going on with the plan. The plan is, the draft plan is posted on the city's website, but um, we'll be receiving comments uh, on the city's website using Open City Hall until June 26th. Um, at that point, we'll the city will review all of the comments, we'll make adjustments to the document, um, and then the final presentation will be made to City Council uh, on July 18th. And once the, the plan is ultimately adopted, the city's going to start using an implementation matrix to actually carry out the plan. And you can see an example of this implementation matrix here. And I'm going to actually ask Mishka if she can just describe it briefly to you. Yeah, sure, Jeff. Yes, so as Jeff said, this gives you a quick snapshot of what a fully filled out implementation matrix would look like. So the matrix has each uh, strategy that is outlined in the plan, and it has several columns affiliated with it. So it has the lead organization that will be, as it sounds, the organizations that the organization that is responsible for leading the task. Given that this is a plan that's created for the economic uh, development and tourism program, um, for the most part, that's the organization that will be listed as a lead. Um, the other column is around those supporting partners. So those are organizations that or even city departments that would serve as co collaborators in terms of moving implementation forward. Um, there are also a few other tabs there related to timelines. So the city will identify um, which year some of these strategies will be implemented and the status column will tell you whether or not um, the city is making progress if they're on track, if it's incomplete, um, or if it's been completed, uh, as well as some notes. So I think uh, the key part here to know about the implementation matrix as well is, unlike the uh, the EDSP update that is static and it doesn't change, the implementation matrix is definitely meant to be more of like a flexible and kind of like evolving tool. So the strategies themselves will stay the same, but in some cases, you know, there may be adjustments to maybe the supporting partners or maybe the timeline, maybe certain actions may need to be pushed out um, to a later time. Um, but it's a pretty good look at how well the city will do in terms of implementing the plan. The economic development and tourism program will make sure that the implementation matrix is updated at least quarterly and posted to the city's website. And the program will also prepare a memo to council in the spring of each year and um, make a presentation to the city council in the fall of each year as well. 
So here we have, not sure what's going on here with the slide. Um, another key component of this project too is related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, as you could see from the plan framework, we have outlined that as a key priority. And in coming up with the strategies for this plan and also considering where the Office of DEI is with its goal setting process and its planning process, we thought it would be best to provide some strategies uh, separately to that particular department. So it's meant to serve as a supplement to the broader EDSP update. Um, it will mirror the framework um, of the existing plan and the strategies and the outlines that will be included within that memo could be pulled forward if resources allow for that. So in terms of a timeline, um, we're expecting that the memorandum will come to council um, and be presented to them from the economic development team, as well as um, the DEI office in around late July or early August. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lee to um, get us started with Q&A and I am going to stop sharing my screen here. All right, Jessica, thank you very much. A um, couple things, because some of the questions that have come in, one, you know, we think we all recognize that housing is one of the major issues that we have in the city of Slow. Um, and we have major city goal programs in the city where we focus on the top four or five things that need to be addressed. And housing and homelessness have their own major city goal. So all of the programs, the majority of programs that are designed to help the housing situation or deal with the homelessness situation are contained in that major city goal. There's some isolated, there's some things we have to do to support that, which are included in the EDSP, but the majority of that work is elsewhere in the city's programs and where that's managed. Um, then we had some questions about um, the partners that we work with, like Chamber, Capali, Downtown Slow were mentioned. We also work directly with the CIE, we work with Slow Partners, Cuesta College, Workforce uh, Development Board, Echo Slow, Cap Slow on our child care grant program, SCORE. There's a lot of pro people that we partner with. We work a lot with REACH. So there's a lot of partners you'll see in the final implementation matrix. San Luis Obispo City is a small town in the middle of a small county in a big state in a big country. So we really have to work together to make things happen. Um, there's a question about the resources for small business and attracting talent. Um, I think we kind of have to look at it as, you know, there's a there's a funnel of talent coming to the region and, and our place in that funnel is to make sure that people are aware of the opportunities here in San Luis Obispo. Some specific examples of that would look like, um, you know, creating videos for different types of jobs that we have a lot of about people who are here and how they like it here and how it's welcoming and those kind of things, and then making data available. So. If employers that need to hire someone can share that information with potential employees, those kind of things. We will be trying to get them here uh, to the city. And then it's kind of the individual employer's efforts from there to get them to their specific business. We also work with the chamber on programs for, uh, for people who are moving here, but their spouse doesn't have a job, getting them connected. Um, programs we're gonna work on with some of the co-working spaces that help people get acclimated to the community and stay here and make connections and maybe move from wherever they're working remotely to actually working physically for a company here. Those kind of things will be the resources we're able to, to work on from a city perspective. Um, and if, if you ask the question and I'm not quite getting to the answer you want, feel free to say, hey, I'd like more information on that in the chat and I'll do my best to, to expand and, and answer the question. Um, so there's questions about affordability are always tough, right? There's certain things the city can do. Most of the things around affordability that we can do are housed in the homelessness, the housing and homelessness major city goal. Things like that, we have a new uh, plan for downtown that increases density. We're, we're working to reduce parking requirements, all those types of things that 
it can help drive down the cost, um, but it is expensive. Coastal California is expensive. A lot of people want to live here. We have some levers we can pull, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's always going to be a challenge on the affordability front for Coastal California. Um, that I think, is there anything Molly or, or Alex or anybody that, that you think we questions we didn't tackle or we'd like to, to speak further about? I think it's important to know that the, the council draft, the draft uh, of the plan will come out a week before the council meeting. Included will be the implementation matrix at that time. We'll be at council on July 18th. Um, and you can come to council with your comments. You can go to Open City Hall, put your comments there. You can also reach out direct, directly to me. Uh, my contact information is posted in one of the answers. I'm always available uh, to answer questions, sit down with people and talk about what we're trying to do on the economic development front. Anybody, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Anything from any of the panelists? Lee, the, the only other thing I would add, and you, you were gracious enough to, to list off a whole host of different partners that the city works with, especially the Economic Development and Tourism Group works with. And I, I will tell you, we have been impressed at every turn, the number of organizations the city collaborates with um, and the amount of interaction that the city has with the residents. Um, we, have, we also want to thank all of those organizations but also thank all of those 140 plus people that participated in our round uh, roundtables and, and uh, community workshops. I also want to thank all of the folks that responded, the enormous number of folks that responded to the community vision survey. That feedback and that input really did help guide this problem, this effort moving forward. And I just want to say how much we appreciate all of those contributions. Yep, totally agree. Thank you, Jeff. Also want to thank all of the people who attended the webinar. Um, if you feel like you missed something, it'll be available on the website and uh, you can check it out. And again, if you have questions, please reach out to me. Have a great day and uh, look forward to seeing you on July 18th. Thank you. Thanks, TIP.